and the kingdom of darkness with light, and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ, to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather together scatters abroad. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 30. We welcome you today to our study of the life and teaching of Jesus the King in the gospel of Matthew. If you haven't got your Bible yet, we want to encourage you to be locating that as we're going to study together Matthew chapter 12 through 15 today as we look at Jesus, the King of Kings and the Messiah of the world. As we turn our attention to the Gospel of Matthew chapters 12 through 15 today, we begin in chapter 12 with, where Jesus has a discourse between Himself and the Jewish elite of that day. He and His disciples were going through the fields of grain. As they're passing through, His disciples on the Sabbath pick some of the heads of grain, which according to the old law would have been doable, would have been something the law allowed. And yet because of this action and because of the lack of love for Jesus that these uh, high priests and that the Pharisees and Sadducees have, they now want to accuse Jesus' disciples of violating the the Sabbath. Well, how is Jesus going to address this problem? Jesus is going to show they did not violate the Sabbath because He is the Lord and Master of the Sabbath. He instilled it for mankind and He definitively knows what it is and is more powerful than the Sabbath. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 12 verse number 8. Jesus said, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Christ is greater than the Sabbath. He's over the Sabbath. He's going to eventually do away with the old law and the Sabbath, but He wants these critics to see His power, to see His majesty, to help them see the error of their way, and to show His greatness as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. I'm reminded of the climax of Peter's sermon as he thought about Jesus, the ultimate Savior and Lord, he said in Acts 2 verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Friend, as part of living for Christ, as part of our, our Christian walk and our mindset, we've got to realize Jesus is in control. He's the Master, He's the Messiah, He's the ultimate Lord above all and over all. And friend, personally speaking, that means He's Lord of my life. I love the words of Saul of Tarsus who later became Paul in Acts chapter 9 beginning in verse number 6. Jesus has confronted Saul as he is on the road to Damascus to do great harm to the church and the cause of Christ and in the midst of that confrontation with Christ. Saul will eventually say, Lord, what would you have me to do? Can you find a better motto for living your life than that? Lord, how do you want me to live my life? And of course, the Bible dictates exactly how God wants us to live our life. 1 Corinthians 6, 6 verses 19 and 20, the Bible says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. What do you mean? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. As we think about Christ as being greater than Lord over the Sabbath and ultimately the application that He's Lord of all and Lord over our life, friend, we need to be willing to submit to, to honor Him, and to give Him preference in our life. My mindset needs to be, what does the Lord, want me to do? What does the ultimate master, the king of kings, ask of me? And then I want to live my life in such a way that it brings honor and glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, 
The Apostle Paul would say, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In Matthew chapter 12, now we're going to learn another very practical lesson from the life and teaching of Jesus, the King of Kings. In Matthew 12, verse 30, Jesus will now say and give this emphatic statement of how we must be either for Him or we're against Him. Jesus said, He who is not with me, Matthew 12, 30, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather together scatters abroad. What's Jesus trying to get across here? We're either for Him or we're not. There's no middle ground. I can't be 50% for God and 50% for something else. I can't be 75% for God. and No, I've got to be wholly committed to the cause of Christ and to putting God first in my life. This is all about priorities. Do you remember Jesus said, in Matthew 6, verse 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. This is about the commitment of putting Christ first in everything that we say or do, making sure that we've got the mindset of the Apostle Paul. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, verse number 21. And friend, if we're not for Christ, listen carefully now. If, we're not, if Christ is not our top priority, if the kingdom's not first, then we're against Him. And you say, well, how can that be? I, I do love God a little bit or I do give God a big portion of my life. God wants first place and He wants that which consumes us to be His part, that which uh, is the most important He needs to be in our life. And so it can't be partly God and partly something else. We want God to have the top priority in everything that we say and that we do. Now, think about this. If we're not for God, Jesus said we're against Him. The world, materialism, all the things that try to pull us away, those make us God's enemy. Listen to James chapter 4, verse number 4. James said with some of the strongest language in the Bible, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself God's enemy. Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot love God and mammon or earthly treasures. And so we want to think about today our commitment to Christ. Is Christ at the top of my priority list? Matthew 6, 33. Is living for Christ what life is really all about? And am I making sure that I give precedence to Christ as Lord of Lord and King of Kings in my life? Now, friend, as we think about the ultimate life and teaching of Jesus Christ, one of the statements Jesus makes that will really stand out and that really helps us to understand how Christ must control our life is this. We need to realize that God is going to judge us by our speech, what we say, if it doesn't bring honor and glory to God. You know, James says in James 3, that the tongue is one of the hardest members of the body to tame. You can think about that in your own life. How many times have you said something you really didn't think about? Or how many times after you said something you wish, man, I could take that back? Controlling the tongue is a big part of letting Christ be the Lord of our life. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now the emphasis here is upon the idle word. Idle means something that has no value. It's not going anywhere. It profits nothing. It's stuck in neutral we might say. And so for the idle word that doesn't honor God, that doesn't lift up mankind, that doesn't help others to draw to Christ, I'm going to give an account of. For every word I speak that's idle, 
I'm going to give account of that in the day of judgment. And so I need to make sure that my words have profit, that my words are not idle, that they're actually progressing and trying to help others to grow closer to God and lift up God and bring glory and honor to His life. And so be careful what we say and let's make sure God has control over it. Now friend, especially this is relative to the teaching of the gospel. James 3 verse 1, James says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. This is not meant to deter people from teaching, but simply to remind them of the seriousness of teaching and preaching the gospel and making sure our words are not idle. The proverb writer said in the long ago, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Controlling the tongue begins with controlling the mind. James said in James 1 verse 19, Let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We need to listen carefully, take it in, think about it, soak it up, and then respond after we've thought about what we hear. And yet too many times that impulse reaction occurs and we just say something before we think about it. Remember Jesus said, We'll give an account for every idle word that we speak. By your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. Now, friend, that doesn't mean that you can't get forgiveness. That doesn't mean that if we say something we shouldn't, that we can't repent and be forgiven and change of that. But if our life doesn't have control of our tongue, friend, there's going to be a big problem in life on the judgment day, and it is indeed a very, very serious matter. Then we turn our attention to the life and teaching of Jesus the King. In the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And here in Matthew 13, Jesus is now going to tell the parable of the sower. A sower went out to sow. That was his part. The one spreading the gospel just goes out and he can teach the gospel. That's, that's his responsibility. He can't make people obey. He can't make them disobey. He just simply spreads the word. That seed, which Luke 8, 11 tells us, is the word of God then falls on different soils. You've got good soil, you've got rocky soil, you've got thorny soil, you've got soil that is choked up by briars. And each of these soils represents a different type of person and a different type of heart fell among the, the hard soil, the stony soil. It took root when the sun, when trials and difficulties came out, it withered away. That which fell among the briars and thorns, it was choked up by the cares. You've seen people like that, excited about Christ and the gospel, and then in a moment of trouble and tribulation, they're back to the old selves. You've seen people who the gospel can really never get into their life because it's choked out by worldliness and materialism. And then we've seen people as well who when the Word of God falls on their ears, when they hear the gospel, that good soul responds properly. They hear the Word of God. That is, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Not only do they hear it, they're ready to obey. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And not only do they obey the gospel, Romans 6, 17, God be thanked that though you were the, the, the sons of darkness, though you were in darkness, you've obeyed from the heart that form of the gospel which was delivered unto you. And so they obey the gospel and they produce fruit. And they're not idle. They're not just sitting a pew. They're not just filling a seat. They're actually getting out and doing something. And so as we think about this parable that Jesus told. You know, the practical lesson is we've got to ask ourselves, how's my soil? You know, if you, if you plant gardens, you need to have your tool, soil tested occasionally, and you might have to add certain minerals, or you might have to put more fertilizer, or you might have to adjust the amount of things that are in lime, or whatever it may be in the garden. Well, what about our heart? What are we doing to make sure that our heart is a receptive place for the gospel. Does Jesus have precedent in my life? Am I making sure that you know my ground is not hardened, that I break up my fallow ground? As Hosea said in Hosea chapter 10, are we making sure that the cares and the pleasures of this world don't choke out our desire to put God first? And are we really submissive to God as we ought to be in striving to live according to His will? Also in Matthew chapter 13, 
Jesus is here going to illustrate for us in a very powerful way a teaching from his life about the power of the gospel. And friend, this shows us and helps us to see we must never underestimate where God's power is. And friend, God's power is not in men necessarily. God's power is in the gospel. And this parable shows us that. Notice Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32. Jesus here says, Therefore I say to you, or excuse me, Matthew 13, 31, Jesus says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it's greater than the herbs, and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This parable shows us the power of the gospel. Remember, the seed is the Word of God, Luke 8, 11. And how did Jesus stress the importance and the power of that seed? He said, well, it's like the smallest seed you can imagine, a mustard seed. If you can imagine the tiniest seed you can imagine in your mind, and yet you take that seed, put it in good soil, and that seed can bring up a magnificent tree, Jesus said, that even the birds of the air can light in. What's that parable all about? Friend, it stresses to us the inherent power in the seed, the inherent power of the gospel. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. The Word of God is living, it's alive, it's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The gospel has the power to change lives, to save people's souls, and to ultimately help us to live the way God wants us to. And so it can make us powerful in the sight of God, in the sense that we trust God, we follow Him, and we are his powerful people today. You know, as we think about the Gospel of Matthew, one of the things that we learn in Matthew chapter 14, especially in verses 13 through 21, is that Jesus himself is the ultimate bread of life. I want you to notice what is said here in Matthew 14, beginning in verse number 13. You've got the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And of course, he takes uh, the loaves of bread and a few fish, and he feeds a mass multitude with that little bit. Uh, John tells us so much so that they take up 12 baskets full of fragments. But watch the lesson beginning in Matthew 13, verse number 17. They said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men besides the women. Think about this great miracle. And in John's account of the gospel, we'll hear Jesus in just a few breaths later say, you ate and you were filled. Now here's the lesson. I am the bread of life. Jesus miraculously took those few loaves of bread and those few fish and he fed 5,000 people. If Jesus physically can feed that many people with that little, imagine what he can do spiritually for our souls. He's able to to give men and women that which they need. Now, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 4. Jesus was tempted by Satan. Satan knew he was hungry, knew he'd been in the wilderness. If you're the Son of God, command that these stones be turned to bread. How did Jesus deal with that? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jeremiah said it this way, Your words were found. And I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. You know, you can get a little bread and fish and fill your stomach, but what about satisfying your soul? What about satisfaction spiritually? Friend, Jesus can give us more than we can ever begin to imagine. That's why he would say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. 
We then, then turn our attention to another lesson of Jesus that really stands out as magnificent. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 23. Jesus comes to His disciples. And they're out on the boat in the third watch of the night in the deep dark of the sea. We might say they've heard these mariner stories about ghosts and sea monsters and things like unto that. And so the sea is disruptive. Jesus comes to them in the midst of that, walking on the sea, and they're afraid. They're fearful. It's a ghost. How does Jesus deal with this situation? Notice Matthew chapter 14. I want you to look at verse number 27 following. After they say it is a ghost and cry out for, for, for fear, Jesus said in verse number 27, But immediately, the Bible says, Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. What, what is this whole story and this example meant to show about the life and teaching of Jesus the King? Friend, it shows us His power over the natural elements of this world. Who can walk on water? Only God. Only the Creator of the laws of nature can control those and manipulate those within His power. Who could calm the storms in just a moment? except Jesus. Who could draw Peter out of the boat and make him walk on water? Peter couldn't do it. When he began to think he was doing pretty good, that's when he sunk. And friend, the main lesson is Jesus is trying to teach. I can control the laws of nature. I'm the Lord of Lord. I can calm the fears in your life that you may have. The Bible says the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If we're on God's side, if we're living for Christ, then God can help us with the challenges and difficulties we face. And unlike the disciples here, we don't need to live a life that is controlled by fear and fear of the unknown, especially for we know whom we have believed in and we're persuaded. He's able to keep that which we've committed to Him until that day. Now, another lesson we want to emphasize from the life and teaching of Jesus is found in Matthew chapter 15. And this is a very practical lesson. Jesus is again going to be confronted by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious elite. They're going to try and condemn Jesus' disciples for not washing according to the tradition of the fathers and to their Jewish tradition. You know, they wash to the elbow, they wash their pitchers, they wash their couches, and they're going to say to Jesus, your disciples didn't do that. They broke the tradition of the fathers and the elders. And Jesus is going to say, wait a minute now. They may have broke man's tradition, but you've broke something far worse. Look at Matthew 15 at what Jesus says in verses 7 through 9. Jesus here says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, This people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Jesus' disciples may have not followed the tradition of the elders, of the people of that day, which wasn't contrary to the will of God, but these people were actually breaking the will of God. How? Following the commands of men. Here's the command of God. Here's the command of men. They elevated the command of men above the command of God. And Jesus said, hypocrites, you want to condemn my disciples for breaking your law when you've actually broken the law of God. And so we want to make sure in this life that we give precedence to the teaching of God, teaching of Christ, and of course, to the words we find in the Bible. Friend, God's commands are the commands that are important. Men may have their ideas, Men may have their thinking. Men may even make up ways of salvation that we don't find in this book. 
But you know what's going to matter on the day of judgment? Jesus said, he who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I've spoken will judge him on the last day. And so, friend, we ask you today, have you submitted your life to Jesus, the ultimate king? Have you obeyed the gospel? Meaning, do you believe in Christ? John 8, 24. Are you willing to change your life, repent of sin, and turn to Him? Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. We're so glad that you've joined us today for our broadcast. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, please write to us or email us at the address to be given. And as always, may God be glorified in the preaching of the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. The Gospel of Christ.